All right. Hello, everyone. This is Peter Zemsky calling to you in, calling into you from Fontainebleau on our campus here in Europe. And we have a phenomenal tech talk today with really two of the legends of the INSEAD tech and venture community here in Europe. Um, you can see here the uh, flow. I'll take just maximum 10 minutes to set things up. And then we'll have a, a real back and forth ping pong with Fred and Nico. Um, do be putting your questions into the chat. Um, Blanca from the uh, 20D class will be feeding questions um, towards the end of the talk. A little bit about the case. So this is this uh, case of Blah Blah Car has featured heavily in, in CIAD for the last five plus years. And it really starts, so I, I'd had Fred as, as a student, um, vaguely remembered him as this, this crazy guy who was always asking you about ride sharing um, before anyone was taking him seriously, except for Nicolas, of course, who, who was listening and, and ultimately helping him get this thing off the ground. When I reconnected with Fred in 2013 and saw what he'd actually created in this space, um, I jumped at the chance to, to write a case on what he was doing. This is right as they were about to close their first 100 million euro mega round of funding, which at the time was really unheard of in France. And there are really three reasons why this case was especially interesting then and today. Well, so first of all, it's a classic digital platform play, right? The digital world is all about that the cost of connecting people have gone way down. And so we're seeing whether it's in marketplaces or social, all of these digital platforms emerge. And there's lots of people running around trying to start them. And again, for most people, it's not as easy as it was for Zuckerberg or Snap. A lot of these marketplaces are hard to get off the ground. And what I liked about this case is this was a particularly tough setting to do it, right? It's a tough setting because it's not like Uber, where I just need a few hundred drivers in a city and I've got a basic service. They're bringing together individuals on both sides of the market. You've got all the people driving between, you know, Berlin and Paris or Lyon and Paris and the people who need rides. And it's an incredibly demanding to get the liquidity on the marketplace in terms of city pairs and in terms of destinations to have a viable transport network. So it's a, it's a really tough challenge like many platform plays. And then at the same time, if you can pull this off, as at the, again, at the time in 2013, they were already doing that in France and a few other countries, you've got tremendous value. Again, you can make profits, but also in terms of where tech was going, people, it's a real opportunity to connect and build a community, and maybe even a more important planet, it's ride sharing, it's reducing the carbon footprint in a country. So you've got, that was a second key theme. And then the last one I hope we'll get into as well on this, this call today is they absolutely were one of the early European unicorns. They've emerged as European champions. Both Fred and Nico were successfully out in California and they chose to come back to Europe, to France. And they've always been quite articulate and passionate about the need to build European tech. And, and so even today, Fred, as we'll talk about, has stepped back from the day-to-day -day CEO um, challenges, leaving that for Nico um, to drive through COVID. And, and Fred's really become a key player in France and beyond in terms of thinking about how we further develop the French and European tech ecosystem. So hope that we get into that as well. Um, so with that, oh, I should also mention that, um, again, many of you on the call, the blah, blah, car may be somewhat new to you. At the same time, many of you have studied it, the case, or even today, we use blah, blah, car. Um, for those who start in CIAD, they take P0, and they basically see Fred and, and Nico at the critical moment in 2016 talking about the challenges they faced. They get lectures from the actual faculty who taught them when they were at INSEAD and, and the students discuss what they would do. Um, one of the raison d'etre for this webinar is to update students on what's happened since we filmed that in 2016. All right, so that's uh, five minutes from me. Fred, Nico, why don't you turn on your cameras and show yourself to the audience 
And um, what I want to do at the beginning, we're going to get into COVID. Welcome, first of all. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's really good. Good to have you back. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Virtually on campus, at least. So I guess we'll start with you, Fred, and sort of remind us kind of where was Blah Blah Car at the end of 2016 going into 2017? What did you build in, in your, this is this end of the period of hyper growth, and what were the growing pains that you, you left Nico to deal with? Well, so what, what we had achieved um, by 2016 was uh, mainly a product that works for long distance coupling and a product that has a business model. It was not that easy because we tried uh, six different business models that you may know. And so it was working on Wave on Mobile. There was a community of about, uh, I would say, 40 million people, maybe 50, uh, made of a third of drivers and two thirds of passengers. So it was really uh, already this kind of uh, marketplace equilibrium. We had raised together with Nico uh, 300, a bit more than $300 million. Um, we had a team of uh, 500 people. In, uh, in about 10 offices and um, the service was operating in uh, 22 countries with uh, headquarters in Paris. Um, and then uh, right after that, when CEO took over the CEO role, I focused on more uh, innovation as well for the uh, short distance product in 2016, 2017 and um, uh, for the commuting trips. And then uh, Nico can do the, uh, the updates since 2016, lots of things have been uh, happening as well. Well, tell us about in terms of pride and what you built because it was a it was a hard road. There was a lot of years of eating pasta as you uh, put this all in place. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the impact of the business? Not not just obviously you were getting some profits now, but on terms of sort of people, community, the planet. Well, I, I think uh, I did not really think too much about what we were achieving at this time. I was just like uh, trying to build it, trying to make it happen, but not really looking at the, for, for me, the, the scale it was reaching was like kind of normal. I've always been in this uh, state of mind that this thing should exist and it should be big. Um, and so someday I would say um, other people realized it was big, but it was already big in my head anyway. So um, then the, the, the mission itself really helped to fuel the energy, I think, like the mission of uh, uh, making a service that would reduce uh, CO2 emission, that would uh, connect more people, that would bring mm. uh, affordable mobility. And so it really played this role. And then uh, by doing so and by doing with our guests, I think we, we built a service which is uh, now considered as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah as, you, as you're showing yeah. here, it's 1.6 million tons of CO2 saved in a year. Uh, that's a calculation we made uh, last year or the year before, but it, it's, uh, uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's more than the entire CO2 emissions uh, that come out of uh, the road traffic in Paris, including the buses and the peripheric uh, per year. So it begins to be uh, quite sizable. All right, so uh, let's put the slides away and, and, and bring Nico into the conversation. So. Um, again, you've played a huge role in building Blah Blah Car. You've done a lot of the fundraising. Um, what, what was sort of the mission as you, you took over in 2016? And what were some of the, you know, changes that you need to make? Yeah, no, it was, as Fred was saying, it was a very interesting phase from, uh, call that 2012 to 2016, where essentially it was all about growth and all about international expansion. So we'd say you're the the big focus of the company was global mobile. So essentially it was about like doing everything, moving into an app and everything moving, moving global. So we went extremely fast. Uh, and and the, the obsession was like planting flags in as, as many countries as we could. Uh, we raised tons of money to do that. Uh, and we went from essentially one country to 22 countries in about four years. Um, so as you do that, you, you create like massive growth, you also create a massive mess, right? Because you, you launch lots of countries at the same time and, and, and you optimize for speed. You don't optimize for, for perfection. Um, and I think you, we've done that. I mean, we've done those mistakes, but we've done that uh, pretty well. So in 2016, I guess it was an interesting turning point in many ways. Um, first, we had to do a bit of triage and clean up in, uh, in this global expansion. So there is a point where you step back and you look at where you've gone. Uh, and you realize that some countries are doing phenomenal. So we had Russia, we had Latam doing well, 
We had some countries like the UK not taking off. We had some countries where it took a bit longer and the model was not perfect. Uh, so, so, so we had to do this adjustment uh, on, uh, on the existing business. Um, we also decided, as Fred mentioned, to slightly change the dynamic actually uh, in the founding team. So you know, there was a point, I mean, especially from the beginning to 2016, the founding team was kind of the board, the founders, but also the executive committee. And you know, all of that was, was essentially in the three of us uh, running the show. We, we changed just, that just a so bit. people know, the, the CTO was someone, I guess, yes. that you've known from before in CI. Yeah, so Francis was, uh, I mean, was is uh, the, the third co-founder. Uh, and he's, he's the guy doing the work, actually. You know, yeah, I, I had met talk, Francis uh, before joining in SEAD, yeah. and then uh, he decided to, to join the project, but he was still working at his other company, and then he decided to, to come join when, uh, actually, mm. about the same time as in SEAD. Maybe it was 2007. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but so, a big so, so we, sort of a shift in the leadership yes, approach. Yeah, so sh shift in leadership uh, approach back in uh, you know, early 2017, late 2016. But also, and probably more importantly, uh, you know, it was about like opening a new chapter. And, and we thought together, like, okay, what do we do next? So we've been doing global expansion. We've been demonstrating that we can scale that model in many countries. Um, you know, what's next for, for, for Blah Blah Car? And, it became pretty obvious to us that the next chapter would not be mostly about geo expansion. It would be about product expansion. And essentially we had built something pretty unique, which was this community of travelers that have like a very rich profile, which you don't do on a, on an airline site or an OTA. I mean, you don't tend to have like a full profile and rating and all the information you gather. And which meant that people came to the platform essentially for free. Like we had very sticky traffic, uh, very high NPS, net promoter score, around 60 to 70, depending on countries. And essentially, we only offered carpooling to people. And we could offer much more because essentially we, we saw that they expressed uh, you know, uh, lots of travel needs. And essentially, we don't fulfill all these needs. So essentially, we decided to expand the product offering uh, going into short distance carpooling, as Fred mentioned briefly. Um, but also pretty much anything on the road. So we started to aggregate buses. We started to acquire a company called WeBus in France, a company called Bus4 um, in, uh, in Russia, which, by the way, if you think of it, is more or less the same scaling model we apply to the geo expansion, we apply to the product expansion. You're a mix of building and buying and, and going fast. So today, over the last three years, I would say, um, we, we've been sort of like building that new journey uh, and also redefining, and that's, that's important maybe to mention that, redefining the mission of Babacar. As now we talk about the go-to marketplace for shared travel, not just carpooling. Obviously, carpooling is the rock bed of that. That's the DNA. Uh, but the mission is not broader than that. Uh, we tend to talk about zero empty seats you know, as, a, as an obsession and a mission. Like, how do we optimize transport with you know, the car being the centerpiece, but also buses and trains and, uh, and all of that? Let me dig in, and then Fred, you can jump in on this. Let me push you a little on the geo expansion because clearly your idea was to get out there and experiment. Um, but what did you what did you learn about where the model works well or less well? I mean, because obviously you could make an argument that it's not by accident that this came out of Europe, with you know high cost of driving and 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 a certain network of cities and things. So what what I think part of it, what, yeah, what did you learn about where the model works well? Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. I mean, first of all, I think you, uh, you know, when you go through this geo expansion, you need to be pretty humble. Uh, and we, I used to joke about that actually internally when people ask like, how do we select a country uh, to, to launch Black Black Car in? And I was saying like, you know, if it's more or less big and square, uh, we just go in and then we find out. Uh, and jokes aside, I mean, sometimes it's almost as basic as that. If you realize you have car and it's a pretty universal product, you, you get to try. Uh, what we found is, and that was interesting because it was almost a handicap uh, in the early story of Blah Blah Car, is that it never took off in the US. Uh, and it probably never took off in the US because you have a bit of a trust building issue, at least at the beginning, you had a trust building issue between like you're connecting with strangers. Uh, but you, you also had like some you know, economic aspect, which is like it's pretty cheap to drive in the US relative, you know, if you look at like disposable income over cost of motoring. Actually, the U.S. is an outlier where it's still pretty cheap to, to drive, so the economic incentive is pretty weak. And you have a fundamental first mile, last mile problem in most cities in the U.S., uh, and essentially it meant like we would have 
uh, requested the driver to taxi in Los Angeles or the Bay Area or wherever mm -hmm. to pick up two or three passengers. So, it, it, you know, we have not launched the U.S. We would have, I mean, we both lived in California. We would have loved essentially to, to, to make a play in the U.S. But it's actually U.S. Uh, never worked. Uh, as a side note, actually, uh, Lyft that most people know, so the Uber competitor, started as a company called Zimride. Uh, and I remember I met them back in 2010, John and Logan in, in Palo Alto. And we thought like, you know, if one day we compete, we've done well because we evangelized the world to, to carpooling. And we never did, but we both did well. Uh, and that was interesting because I also took that as a proxy that two pretty smart guys tried, failed, decided to pivot, became successful. So I want to actually dig in on the first part though. So, so that, that's very helpful to understand. Um, but again, what you also talked about at the very beginning is I think the fact the U.S. is such a reference for tech. The fact that your model didn't fit the U.S., did, did that make it then more challenging to go global, do you think? Fred, I'll push you on that one. Yeah, to, so, so maybe to kick it off, to, to, because I was mostly doing that at the very beginning, mm. uh, for fundraising, it was a real handicap at the beginning because the European VC mentality was that essentially if it does not exist in the US, it's not gonna exist in Europe. And, and Europe was just like essentially a time lag to US innovation. Right. Um, turned out to be a huge advantage as we scaled because we became like something unique uh, yeah. and we not right. some kind what, of copycat yeah. of anything. A little bit yeah, it's true. Each that? time we were in the US at this time, uh, we had to explain what we were doing and then they were like, oh, so you're like Uber. Like, no, we're not like Uber. <laughs> so, oh, you're like Lyft. No, 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 we're not like Lyft. And so then, then we were sort of an animal that, that did not exist in the U.S. And so uh, we were not on the map. And so we had to, ex to explain what we were doing. It was pure C2C carpooling and not with uh, um, professional drivers or whatever. And so uh, this was both a handicap, as you say, because we could not really scale our service in the U.S. for the reasons uh, Nicolas mentioned. But also uh, it was kind of an advantage because we didn't have a, a big American actor like coming and trying to expand in our countries. So um, that's, uh, that's the way we were able to uh, actually also uh, grow with this unicity, which actually may reflect, as you were mentioning, uh, possibly a European way of uh, seeing um, the sharing and the trust that we've been able to build as well. Uh, all the trust system we've built uh, is, um, I would say, is, uh, totally linked to the culture. Um, you know, one day when we made uh, our values for, uh, we, we really gathered the entire company to um, settle what were our values, um, but like the main core uh, values, we, we came up with three words, uh, which are freedom, fairness, and fraternity. And then we tried to translate them in France and we're like, okay, so freedom is like liberté, fairness, <laughs> uh, fraternité maybe, and um, uh, well, fairness uh, is um, égalité, uh, égalité or, or like maybe uh, mm. some other words. And then fraternity is fraternité. And we're like, okay, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Does that uh, ring any bell, guys? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we remarked that actually in our DNA by uh, doing as we felt, we had built a company which was totally, um, totally linked with the culture we originated from. Okay, so um, and again, but in many ways, you, you, you did have both this European element and again, all of these, I'd say, tech startup culture that you brought from California. The things like, let's try and learn fast and you had all those kind of elements. Um, but then I wanna just to probe slightly on the bus move. How, were there law, when you, when you teamed up with your arch competitor, the state rail system and bought their bus company. Um, a lot of debates there. Um, how's that working out? Any comments on, on that part of the bus move? Yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, carefully. I think you have, you have two parts to that, right? You have one that was a fundamental conviction that I think we developed over time and that became mature in 2016, 17 in our head was what I was describing earlier. Like we have to become multimodal. We have to leverage this large community to do more than carpooling. And we have to use the car's universal connector in transport. So the long-term vision that we have not reached yet is we need to offer buses and train and connect all of that and become this, you know, we go to marketplace. That, that's an obvious move for, for many passengers to book, you know, whatever gets them from A to B in mid-long mid -long distance. So that was pretty clear. 
Then there is the how you get there, right? So, so suddenly you realize like how do we get buses on the platform? Uh, and essentially, we, buses were in play at that point. So there's lots of buses, innovation coming yeah. around Europe, right? It's not you can't sit it, around it, and do it slowly. Well, it, it, exactly. It was a moving world, and essentially, it's a world you could split in two. Uh, there was Europe, which strangely enough discovered long distance coach, at least continental Europe, like France, Germany, Italy, and so on with the deregulation of transport in 2015, I mean, it was between 14 and, and 16, I don't remember exactly. Uh, 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 that, so that was one side of the market. And then you had the rest of the world, uh, you mostly countries where we operate carpooling like Russia, Ukraine, Latin in general, India, where essentially those are huge markets, highly fragmented, mostly booked offline. Um, and to tell the truth, I, 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 I get this person a lot more excited about the rest of the world because you realize that's kind of a rare play where you look at this like you know, tens of billions of dollars of bus booking, highly fragmented, not sophisticated, all booked offline. And it will, the, you know, the question is how, by who, and, and when, but it will go online. Uh, so so, so you know, digitalizing this entire world was interesting. In Europe specifically, it was a different play because you had like, like essentially like a few people moving in, creating this new market and not fragmented and not offline directly online. Um, and essentially the only fast track was an acquisition. Uh, and it's true that you know, back in 16 or 17, if you had told me like, hey, maybe you're gonna go and acquire a subsidiary from SNCF and transform it to accelerate um, uh, that journey, I think we would have both have, both have laughed a bit right uh but you know all the time you know, you, mm. we we had good contact with sncf we, we were never in like direct fierce competition actually we always saw that as compliments um and it turned out that you know their strategy was to divest from non-trained business our strategy was to become this multimodal play uh and yes it became this sort of like you know, strange m a where it's the, the startup acquiring a, a, a subsidiary from the large national rail company but it's but also it was more like the path like to, to the, get to the goal. Yeah, we, we, we followed a, an overall strategy. We had two choices mainly, I would say, in 2016, uh, which were either to go um, on. We had two assets. We had the community, which was already big and growing in all the, in the countries. And we had this um, possibility to address uh, transport needs of uh, the people and then propose them several means of transport, which is the one we chose. We could have, uh, we, we really had this, uh, this fork in, the, in our past. We could have gone fully on community and propose other services uh, that uh, people can help each other, uh, on which like you could, you could think of all the uh, classified models that you modernize with transactional models, uh, or like everything that people are doing when they help each other could, could have gone in this, uh, in this direction, including an Airbnb-like uh, service or something like that. Um, or we could go uh, the multimodal way and we saw that um, in the multimodal way, we would exploit our two main assets, the community and the fact that we were labeled like a transport solution, which, uh, would, uh, which was making and is still making our legitimacy in, uh, in offering several means of transport. The strategy professor in me is loving this. These are exactly the kind of big check questions we love to teach about. Now, of course, we know execution is always a little bit interesting. So as you guys moved into buses in the different markets, as Fred, you tried and, and did some interesting things around uh, short distance carpooling. Um, were there any particular surprises, things that you, you know, that, that uh, either positive or negative that popped up before COVID? We'll go to COVID in a second. But um, in 2019, what was interesting? So, so I would say two things. I don't know if there's surprises, but, 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 but it's two things that have been pretty interesting to me. I mean, one, you know, I would say one very positive on strategies. The, the, the whole idea was to create two very complementary networks, right? So, so one thing we have not mentioned is carpooling is extremely good at doing point to point and we've been working. So we, we changed a bit the product paradigm in 2017 and we decided, okay, we need to push carpooling not to compete with buses and train, but actually to map out the rest of the network that's dominated by cars. Um, so the real enemy, I would say, 
of carpooling is not trains and buses, it's actually people driving their car alone. So it's, a, it's actually like empty seats in cars and that's what we, we, we fight against. And we found that you know, as we integrated uh, buses in France, same thing in Russia, now we're doing it in, in, in Brazil, it's highly complementary. There is very little cannibalization. So essentially we increase the pie and we don't cannibalize any of these two modes of transport because the topology of the network is highly complementary. Then from a pure, uh, I would say culture point of view, uh, it's, it's interesting because it's more challenging. So in a sense that you, when you start integrating um, a company that was a subsidiary of SNCF, uh, and, and that was a pretty big team, that was 150 people. Back then we were roughly 500 people, uh, bare, I mean, even a bit less. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big mass in proportion of your company and your culture. And you know, it came from a different culture uh, that was a lot less of a digital marketplace type culture, but more an operator culture. Um, so those sort of post-merger integration take a lot of time, a lot of smart people. Um, and you know, even if you have the right theory on, on strategy, which I hope we do, we'll find out, I guess, in, um, in a few years, you can screw it up actually uh, if you do like you know, this very fast MA uh, built up. And remember, like we acquired two companies, one in Russia with 100 people plus one in France with 150 people. So we've done two very bold moves within 2019. And the challenge was, okay, how do you digest that uh, you know, and, and, and take the, the juice of that? Um, I want to see, we've got lots of questions. We've got a, a big audience out there and a lot of questions coming in. So Blanca, even though I said that you've come in later, do you want to just shoot in um, a couple of the questions um, following up on this conversation before we go on to the pandemic? Blanca, here she comes. Welcome. Hi. Hello. Hi, Peter. Uh, hi, hi Nicolas and Frederick. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, indeed, we have very interesting questions popping up. Uh, I think one here by Marta Agwech is really interesting, probably addressed to Frederick. I, Frederick mentioned that BlaBlaCar tested six different business models. Could you develop this further? Uh, what have you learned along the way? And how did you manage to transfer the business model change to the customers? Okay, this is a, it's a very good question. I'll try to have a very good answer. Um, the, what we've done with the six business models is really trying out uh, what we thought could work. Uh, so we tried a B2B business model, we tried an advertising business model, uh, a business model as well where you simply uh, uh, put people in contact through a phone line and then you take a cut on this. Uh, we tried also platforms for, uh, for companies, of course, but also for concerts or events. Uh, and then we've, we tried the um, transactional business model that we have today, which is a very simple uh, commission business model where you take a cut on each transaction. Uh, so what I've learned uh, during those years is that when a business model works, you see it. Uh, if you don't see it and you're questioning yourself and you're wondering if it works, it means it doesn't. Uh, it means it's just like in the middle. And, and so, of course, sometimes you try the business model and, and it clearly doesn't work. Then, then it's easy. You, you say, okay, fail, move on. The worst case is when you have a business model which seems to work or wants to work, but it, it's not really bringing you all satisfaction. It means, actually, it doesn't work. It means you need to look further. <laughs> until you find the right. right one. Because when you find the right one, there's no doubt. So one, one thing to remember everyone is although that transaction business model for sharing economy is kind of known now, these guys were pioneers and it wasn't so obvious at the time. One thing that's interesting though, in the second part of the question, is oftentimes you launch free and then you, in, you add the, tra the, the transactional model. What have you learned about introducing that business model into new markets? Oh, uh, I've learned we, you shouldn't do it uh, in a big bang way. You should go slowly for many reasons. Uh, the first reason is that you want to test out first if this business model is really adding some value to the service and to the community. So the first uh, users will tell you if it does or not. Or if they think that uh, you're asking them to pay but they don't see the value or what would they like to see uh, if they pay or if they pay more. 
And so we were also lucky because we were transitioning from a model which was not totally free, which means people were already participating in the fees of the ride. I mean, what, what, uh, what happens is that um, when you go from Paris to Rennes, let's say, uh, what happened before was that the uh, passengers would give, let's say, uh, 20 euros to the driver, and then uh, that was happening in cash. But then when we transitioned to a commission-based model, maybe it would go from 20 to 22 euros, but it's not like as if it was going from zero to 22. So that's also uh, right. very uh, important to mention. That's very clear. Bianca, why not, Blanca, another question. I see a very interesting question here from Jan Cuerza from Rwanda, which is blah, blah, car seems to have gone into most of emerging markets, but stayed out of Africa. Any specific reason or is it that you see no opportunity there? No, I would say it's, it's not yet. Uh, so, so, so the fact you, in 2016, we decided to pause uh, international expansion. And as I said, we moved to a product um, type expansion. And now we're building that carpool plus bus offering plus train in markets where it's, it's relevant in most markets. So, so in France, we're going to do bus, train, carpool. Uh, in markets like Brazil, there are no trains. So it's going to be bus, bus, bus carpool. Uh, you know, the ambition, and I hope, I mean, we'll talk about the COVID context, which might slow down that type of ambition by a year or two, we'll see. Uh, but, but the ambition is to go back with that multimodal model in other countries. And clearly there are lots of countries we, we have not done yet. Africa uh, is an obvious place uh, where, where we, we could and should go at some point. Uh, some countries in Asia uh, are also untouched territory. So we'll probably go back to international expansion, but not the same way we've done it in the past. In the past it was, okay, we need to create that carpooling community because we have a good product and we want to scale that um, in a, as many countries as possible. Here we'll probably go back with that multimodal offer and say, okay, now we have this new playbook and new recipe. Let's go and apply that to, to more markets. So basically, uh, we know. didn't go on one foot, but we may go, uh, we may go back with uh, two feet or more. All yeah, right. we'll come back Don't with go, something we'll, better. We'll come back. Thanks for popping in. We'll come back to you in a second. Um, we're going to go and do some COVID. There's no, we can't. Uh, we can't avoid the pandemic any longer, gentlemen. And I think here, just to kick us off, um, here are two slides. So this one, quickly, this just shows like what you'd achieved, say, in France by 2019, right? You built this incredible multi-model network, and then boom. Okay, so I guess, Nicolas, you, you, you got to manage through this. Tell us a little bit about how bad COVID hit, um, what were some of the challenges, and I guess what people are particularly interested what are you seeing today and looking forward? Yeah, uh, 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 and maybe just before we jump into that specifically mm -hmm. on the, the impact of, uh, of COVID, I, I think that's a good reminder of you know, what I call the unknown unknowns. Like that's the thing that was not on the business plan, that's on no business plan, no investment memo, that there would be a global pandemic and that's going to stop the world and that's a risk for your business. I think no one could foresee that. Uh, and that, that, you know, that's interesting because those type of events uh, happen actually more often uh, than we think. Like you know, if I look at my 20-ish year career, well, there was 9-11 and the dot-com crash in Silicon Valley. I was there. Then I had the great idea to go into venture capital in 2007, boom, 2008, 2009, this ma massive financial crisis. Uh, but it, it happens more often that, than we think that you have these like massive externalities completely changing the game, more so than any competitor fundraising and sort of like normal incremental operation. So anyway, so that's what happened, like big tsunami uh, in, the, in the world and specifically in the transport industry. Uh, and essentially in Q2, we were shut down. Like, you know, like no one was traveling pretty much on a, on a global scale. And we went back to volume of activity that you know, Fred and I would see back at INSEAD kind of thing. So it was back to square one in terms of, uh, of volume on, uh, on, on the platform. Now, uh, so you know, clearly if we take the, the overall context, you know, there are less people traveling right now. Uh, we are in a world where demand for shared travel has lowered for sure. Uh, how long it's gonna, it's gonna stay, we don't know. But we also in a world of highly unpredictable demand, right? So, so I would say you know, beyond the fact it's lower, it's highly unpredictable. And when you say that, it becomes interesting because if you look at this C2C model, like very marketplace C2C model, it's actually really good 
a, a, take, a taking shocks because it essentially shuts down on itself and it restarts on, the, on itself and you have no fixed cost. Like you don't need to buy plane, trains, buses. You don't need to contract operators. You don't need to prepay. You essentially, you don't need to take risk on inventory. Um, so f from a, I would say from a PNL point of view, we absorb the, the cash point of view, we absorb the shock really well. And as you can see on the, on the graph you're showing, I don't know if people see, see the slide, yeah, but you see a very fast rebound uh, in, in activity post COVID uh, because people came back uh, and people started to share again and, tra and travel again. So I, I would say the, the fact that we are a community that we don't have fixed cost that fundamentally we driven by domestic trips, not international trips. We driven by leisure, not business trips. So you don't zoom to see your girlfriend, boyfriend or parents, you, you, you need to move. Uh, and we tend to be in a pretty young uh, price sensitive audience. Uh, you, if you put all of that together, actually we rebounded much faster uh, than you know, any alternative. So today you in, in, abs in absolute term, we're doing less than we thought we would do clearly in 2020, given the context. Interestingly, in relative term, um, we gain market share in every market. And I'll add actually one um, interesting element actually in uh, specifically non-European markets where we aggregate buses. Actually, we see this activity still grow on a year, uh, year on year basis. Why? Not because people are traveling more, they're traveling less, but because the other story of COVID is an offline to online acceleration. Like, you, like lots of people, I mean, online payment is exploding, online e-commerce and all these things have been exploded in, uh, in those markets. So actually the proportion of people booking their trips, their, their bus journey online in markets like Brazil, Russia, and Ukraine mm -hmm. has increased faster than the, 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 the overall, I would say, tide has, uh, has gone down. So in relative terms, we, we're doing pretty well. Uh, Maybe just to, to, to finish on that, also culturally, I think we absorbed that pretty well uh, by keeping you know, essentially like you know, all the engineers, all, all, all the product staff, uh, not, I mean, we have not used for, for this for this part of the company, um, uh, all the unemployment benefits and, uh, uh, and different schemes you have available in Europe. And we decided to innovate. Uh, so we launched actually um, a couple of new products uh, during, the, during the, the lockdown. One of them is called Blabla Bla Help. And essentially what we've done is essentially leveraging the trust in the community so that people actually can connect to their neighbors and help them do groceries during the lockdown. Uh, and we've seen, and we launched that on a global scale um, as a free product. Uh, and that's a way to stay engaged with your community. So I think part of the rebound is also those type of things. Like you, when you keep on communicating and about like you, essentially you doing good uh, and you being proactive during that type of crisis and offering the community something um, they need actually probably also helped actually get people back um, back in cars and sharing their cars in, in June and July and, and today. Fred, I want to bring you in on that also COVID, but also particularly on that question about to what extent is it accelerating digital? So, so now you spend, you know, a, a lot of your time heading up uh, France Digital, really representing the tech and startup whole you know, community in, in France. So you have a, a vision on what, what's going on. How's that community doing overall um, in the current crisis? Well, it's, it's been accelerating. I mean, it's, no, uh, it's not a scoop, but uh, what we've seen is that, uh, for example, if you take um, companies like Dr. Lib, they had a thousand uh, views, like uh, teleconsultation, video consultation per day. They do like uh, remote consultations for, uh, for doctors. Now they are at more than a hundred thousand per day, so it's like it's been multiplied by a hundred. So uh, you have other examples where the e-commerce has been doubled, uh, where remote working has been multiplied by ten. Um, this kind of numbers is just totally crazy. Just like we had not uh, scheduled in advance for such a crisis, which could hit the businesses, we had not uh, planned for for such a crisis, which could like multiply the businesses of uh, some of the companies uh, so far. So I would say, and as uh, President Macron said the other day, like uh, three weeks ago at the Elysee, he, he said that actually digital was COVID proof. Um, sort of a, a way to mention that uh, the digital interaction is um, something which is compatible with remote 
uh, interactions. So when we can't see each other, we have communication means to do things remotely. And overall, the digital really benefited from that. Uh, so of course you have exceptions. And so uh, I would say we're in the middle. Um, you have companies which only work for like uh, creating events or in the international tourism, who of course are really uh, severely hit. But in companies like us, we're in the middle and some others really rotated. So, um, and, and we've seen that in France as well. Um, uh, and, and the ecosystem has resisted very, very well because it's been helped as well by the uh, government. So we've got 80% uh, of the startups uh, which took out a state uh, guaranteed loan, which we call the GPE, so the, uh, the PGE, the Prêt Garantie par l'État. Uh, and we have 52% uh, of the companies which benefited from short time working during uh, lockdown, uh, which also help companies go through this period, including digital companies. So it, it's kind of resist, it's been resisting very well. So Fred, I'm curious, well, you mentioned government a few times, how things are shifting in Europe. So even before COVID, you had the new EU commission that was starting to make a lot of noise about supporting digital. Obviously, Mac Roll from the beginning had targeted this sector. Do you find that the Europeans are somehow getting more focused on, on their digital ecosystem in the, in, with COVID? Actually, the, yeah, um, there are two main tendencies. Uh, the, one of the tendency is really to make things more sustainable and to go towards, uh, um, I would say, a world which is aware of uh, the fact that climate is evolving and we need to do something, but not only climate, it's also about inequalities and some sort of uh, other sectors in which we have strong values in Europe. Uh, we have uh, values of responsibility and um, uh, social help and uh, solidarity and uh, all these things which we put uh, forward when we create businesses as well. So um, the, the tendencies have been both, I would say, on responsibility and on digital. Uh, and it is reflected by all the plans we see, the, the plans for, uh, for like uh, relaunching the economy, uh, both in France and at, at the European scale. So today, really the message that is being sent by France and Europe is that we have two legs going forward. One is on responsibility and the other one is uh, on the tech more broadly than digital. Well, I'll bring Nico in on this as well. But first, I thought it would be useful for you, Fred, as president of France Digital, We'll do some quick polls of the INSEAD audience on some related topics. So let's, um, we're gonna, actually, I'll maybe, um, let me pull up and say what my first poll is gonna be here. Well, okay, let's, let's just open it up. Is that, is that poll open? Yes. So it's, it's really around how active should governments get? So um, should they really, and then there's, you start to hear this talk about digital sovereignty. You look at Thierry Breton, who's the, uh, EU commissioner from France. And so um, uh, certainly I think, Fred, if you, if you thought if we'd had this conversation a decade ago, I think we would have been much more free market. Um, and let's, let's see where the NCI community comes out on this. Um, so you guys have 10 more seconds to make up your mind and, and say- Do we know where uh, everybody's from? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, it's an INSEAD audience, so it's pretty global. But again, with okay. time, it's a lot of Europeans. I, I, you, can, you can imagine a good number of Europeans here. Uh, so here we go. All right, uh, five more seconds. We've got a good sample. We've got, you know, you're, we're, 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 we're well over 300 um, people. So uh, who answered already, 350. All right, folks, I think we've got enough to show Fred. Here we go. Um, so, uh, so only, 9% are sort of still, this is a bad idea. Um, six, so 15% neutral. The most common um, response now is limited support. Governments should actively be developing their, their, their local ecosystems. And still over 25% think actually maybe you should be constraining foreign competition, which typically means big tech coming out of US or China. Um, I don't know how, you guys, I mean, how do you want to take, has your shifting on this issue changed or the people in the, the tech community, is it shifting? Fred, well, maybe I, first. I would say I, it's very interesting. We should actually have the same poll like 10 years ago. If you had that, that would be very interesting because I think what's been happening and, and with the, um, 
uh, with the rise of uh, the rise of the uh, the tech giants, we've seen also what's happening now. Everybody's using the the solutions, um, which are global solutions, and we've been creating uh, also companies which are super big. Uh, you know, like what the other day a statistic uh, appeared, like the the GAFAM, like so the 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 five biggest uh, tech companies in the U.S. Uh, represent actually five times more in valuation than the entire CAC 40 of France, uh, which is a 40 uh, top companies. So um, we see that there is some kind of a world domination. And 10 years ago, actually, this, those same GAFAMs represented 10% of the CAC 40. So it's been an acceleration, which is uh, incredible, uh, which also creates uh, some problems that we see because, of course, those companies are very well equipped to uh, not only um, become more uh, aggressive and, and investing a lot more in, in uh, taking up some uh, remaining markets they may not have because they have lots of uh, money to do so, but also they are also um, trying to optimize their taxes everywhere and we see the problems that it creates because they get uh, lots of uh, revenues from areas where they don't always pay all the taxes they should. So this is uh, creating lots of tension. And so there's one thing which I had heard a lot um, uh, during like all the the, the years uh, we we were saying um, like we we should have a free market and everything is that monopolies should be broken and regulated uh, and so I think we we are at a stage where we we now see why and we need to to act and also in Europe we uh, we've been playing a part I would say and we've been playing. Uh, like j just like in music, you know, we've maybe we've been a playing a part which we can be very proud of, like uh, opening everything and be free about everything, and uh, have an open market. And, but maybe uh, we should uh, revise a bit that part because when we see um, that, uh, of course, uh, other areas um, tend to to uh, favor a bit more their own solutions, we see that it's a strategy which when, is. When you say uh, other areas, you mean U.S. and China, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we see that the U.S. Well, I have a statistics that the uh, U.S. Um, uh, public ordering, you know, for solutions that uh, among the top 200 companies who answered and got the uh, the markets uh, for the in 2019 in the U.S. Uh, you have 89. 0.5% of those companies which were American. So we see that the um, uh, public uh, American uh, mm -hmm. government is, is buying American. In China, they are buying China. And in Europe, we buy European and Chinese. Uh, but we also need to buy European, uh, uh, possibly, uh, to really create the momentum we want to see. So Nicholas, I often think about you as sort of a VC kind of guy, hard-nosed finance, a little bit. Um, how ha Has your thinking shifted on this? What's your view um, on sovereignty and digital yeah i mean I, actually not really i think it's just like now it, it's becoming more topical but you know, if anything i think covid has been a wake-up call um for europe that was long due that was very long due uh that, that suddenly we realize that yes tech is strategic uh that yes the biggest company in the world today are whatever we want to call that tech digital uh companies but it's been long coming, uh, you know, like, like I mean, for me, like I was in Silicon Valley back in 99, 2000. And, and you could see that the Intel and the Cisco and the Apple of the world were, were building the future. And, uh, and, and Europe was just like harvesting the past. Uh, mm. and, and, that's, and I think we, we've been doing that way too long. So there's been this wake up call. So, so in a way, I'm glad. I, 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 I still think to, to maybe to make it in more blunt way I, I still think we incredibly naive uh in um, in europe like right? if you look at the way it's been managed uh and now we're waking up to the fact that yes we need to to build some kind of protectionism um at the european scale and we have a hard time to organize around that um but it is time like you know, there's always been some type of protectionism obviously in china obviously in china uh, but even in the U.S., as Freddie is saying, the U.S. government is buying from U.S. companies. Uh, they, they always protected the market indirectly. And, and I think we've been pretty naive uh, around mm -hmm. that uh, in Europe about tech because it was not recognized as something important and strategic and creating jobs because we've done that in any other industry. Um, so now it's bound to change. And I just wanted to add something that I, I think the opportunity is actually thinking of not really what's been done, but what's coming next. And what's coming next is, is probably some sort of industrial revolution around the environment. Like we need to rethink mm -hmm. lots of industries. 
And you know, that's going to come in some shape or form. Regulators have a, have a great role to play. Uh, and if you look at, uh, at Europe, we're doing pretty well in terms of like CO2 reduction, in terms of like consumer awareness. Yeah. So some of these big companies should come out of Europe. Like Tesla should be a European company, except you know, we didn't wake up early enough. Um, but, but I think the next, the, the next companies like Tesla ought to be European. So, so I think as, as founders today, um, I think surfing on, uh, on, on the environmental European momentum is, is hopefully a good thing. Anyway, for people in the audience, what Fred and Nico are, are articulating is I think more and more where the thinking is going in leaders in tech, at least in Europe. Um, Blanca, come on back and why don't you fire a few um, questions at, at our guests. Hi. Um, uh, we see a couple of questions coming up regarding competition that I think are interesting. Uh, the question would be, who do you think, would you, who would you say are your competitors today? And do you fear Uber's mission to become a one-stop shop for transportation um, be you know, detrimental for your business? Do you see yourself entering the Uber Lyft core business? Right. So what I'm going to ask you guys is give um, sort of short, punchy answers, and we'll, we'll do a bunch of questions. You don't have to give the full thing, but just quick. Yeah, what do you, what, yeah. what's the current answer on the Uber question? Uh, so I, we've been talking about Uber as competition for many, many years. Uh, I, I think the reality is they operate in the in-city short distance uh, arena, which is huge. We operate in the mid-long distance arena. Maybe one day, they're gonna cross, uh, but but I you know, short term, I I don't I, I don't think there is. I mean there are synergies, but no no direct competition. Good, Blanca. Next question. Okay, uh, Mark Lagres here with a very interesting question regarding data. Yes, the question would be how does Dablacar optimize data for customer experience, and also mm -hmm. what is your strategy? You mentioned before uh, environmental concerns. Why is it is a strategy for data storage regarding its environmental impact and also, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, the privacy issues arising from data? Great, yeah. A lot of small questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to do one punchy answer on this one. <laughs> no, 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 just kept, well, well sir, actually, start with how you use data to optimize the rides. Some of the, I think that's really good. Well, it's, it's through uh, machine learning. Go for it. Uh, and, and the itineraries, so mainly we try to optimize uh, itineraries and to optimize uh, stops for, for, uh, for everybody. And to also optimize uh, a bit on the prices to make sure that uh, everything is uh, equilibrated. Uh, and what about, yeah. do you guys worry about the, your cloud footprint? And I mean, you're an environmental company. Do you worry about who's hosting your data? What the electricity is being used? Um, what do you, how do you respond so, on so maybe that? Be, before, or, be, before we jump on, uh, before we jump on, 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 on this one, I think it's, it was an important, uh, an important question actually, because over the last few years, essentially we transformed carpooling into a driver declaring he's going from point A to point B and wants price P to something where essentially they just tell us like when they're leaving, where they're going and we match them at the right price on the, on the route and, and, and we define all this machine learning uh, so we've become very much like a machine learning data company. And that's something we people don't see actually because the product has not changed and we make it simple, but it's all about matching optimization. But just to give, because people sometimes ask, what's the return on machine learning? Do you have a sense how much extra revenue you get because you're able to better optimize the routing? Is it is it a 1% so, so, thing? So, is it a 10% thing? So I'll, I'll give you, because we, we have an interesting number on, on that. So... Uh, 25% of the activity today, and it's growing fast, is actually generated uh, by what we call smart stops, that essentially a machine learning algorithm has calculated to better match the passenger and the, and the driver. So it is huge. Uh, and frankly, it's gonna go to more than 50% in the next couple of years for us. Great, okay, Fred, you're, you're the, you're the uh, green advocate. What are you gonna say about your, 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 your cloud footprint? The, the, main, uh, the main answer is that we're trying hard and it's never enough. 
uh, anyway, anything we can do to reduce that footprint uh, has to be has to be made. There's another consideration which has to be taken into account is that uh, anyway, by calculating our environmental footprint as a service overall in the community of nearly uh, 100 million people, uh, we know that the more we grow, the more we save CO2 uh, and in a massive way. Uh, so anyway, our role is really to make sure that our service gets expanded uh, as much as possible. And then it has some uh, environmental impact on the digital side. But since we're a marketplace optimizing, uh, optimizing, uh, optimizing the um, resources, the physical resources, we're like, there are several marketplaces like this. Uh, you have uh, also a back market, which you may know, which uh, is a platform for like uh, refurbished electronics. You also have uh, some uh, other uh, platforms in, in different areas, which are doing this kind of optimization. The more we grow, the more we optimize. Uh, you know that if you use a refurbished phone, for example, it's uh, uh, 10 times less impacting on the environment than ordering a new one. So uh, anyone who's watching this video should keep their mobile phone as long as possible. So mine is almost four years old and I think I will write something on it saying I'm old and I'm proud, um, <laughs> but something like that. But it, I mean, we should keep our electronics uh, and not like replace it every 18 or 20 months because this is a disaster. Okay, it's another Blanca, topic. you got one more question, fire away. Okay, there's many interesting questions in the chat, but I guess because we're running out of time, my last question is actually two, sorry. <laughs> and uh, it would be, what advice would you give to MBA uh, graduates right now, especially those interested in entrepreneurship and tech? And also, what do you look for in an MBA uh, candidate? Yeah, so yeah, a lot of um, the job market is shifting. People are looking at scale ups and stuff. Any advice? Well, my advice would be follow your guts. Um, you have two brains, uh, your reason and your heart. And we're, too, we're using someone some, sometimes too much, the reasoning and the analytical brain. Uh, I would say, you know what is good uh, to, to be done for the next decade or more in the business. And so since, especially if you want to create something new, uh, I don't know how many people are watching who want to be uh, or already are entrepreneurs, but when you're an entrepreneur, you're creating something that does not exist. So any analytical um, document or study that you may read will not give you the, the main passion for uh, building what's next and you should follow your guts and, and, and what you know inside you, your, uh, your heart is actually your best counselor. Yeah, and I would say it's also like the best time right now. Your crisis tend to be the best time to start companies. Uh, and especially because now you have funding out there. Uh, you have like a very noisy world uh, where you know, the future is not clear. That is the best time to start companies. Uh, so I would really encourage people to start companies. As you do so, find co-founders. It's a tough journey. If you're alone starting a company, it's, it's a tough journey. So... You know, we were lucky to be to be three and uh, and to help each other. I would say find and a co-founder who wants to become the CEO as well. <laughs> <laughs> that worked yeah. for you, Brad. <laughs> and uh, but but it really matters. I think you're know, like solo teams today are it's it's tricky. I think it's really tricky. Uh, and in terms of what what I've always looked for when I hire people or whether it's MBA or when I do angel investing, it's really three things. I often describe it this way: it's passion because you need tons of passion to, to, you, to change things and create great products and so on. Stamina, because that's a hell of a journey and it's not going to go right all the time and you get COVID and you get competition and you get no sayers and so on and so on. And something special, like you, the people that either like super analytical or artistic. So it's about passion, stamina and something special. Mm. All right, gentlemen. La thank you very much, Blanca. Great uh, sorting through all those questions. Amazing questions. Um, any, I don't know, some last messages, what, real short, what makes you guys optimistic about 2021 as we get out of this tunnel? Do you want to stop, Nico? Nico, what makes you? <laughs> but it's funny, I never know how to answer those questions because I think I'm always optimistic. So I always think like next year is better than the year before. Uh, so I mean, if I answer for it's us, it's going to be hard for I... 21. <laughs> No, no, I mean, for 21, post-COVID is going to be interesting. I, 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 I think the, the, the fact that we kept on investing and that we, we've gained market share, I, th I think 2021 and beyond, actually, might be a massive acceleration ramp, actually, 
um, uh, for us. But you know, in general, I'm pretty optimistic we're going to get out of that. It's just going to be different. We just need to acknowledge that if you expect the same in 21, 22, you'll be sad. If you yeah. expect change, you'll okay. be happy. Fred, any, uh, what's exciting? Yeah, you? I would say overall what really makes me optimistic and actually happy about what's happening right now is that uh, finally, I would say, uh, in, including with the latest uh, declarations of the European commissions, we are um, positioning the entire European ecosystem on uh, becoming more uh, climate friendly. Um, it is, the signal is very, very clear. Uh, we had the Paris Accord a few years ago, but now we, we're going a bit further and we're putting money uh, on, the, on the issue. And I think it's actually a very uh, unique opportunity for Europe um, to attract international talent uh, to really make this happen. And, you know, uh, we had launched this uh, initiative, uh, Tech for Values, uh, a few months ago, pre-COVID uh, in San Francisco, Peter. Yeah. Um, we have, so it's, it's Tech for Values, uh, techforvalues.com actually, where we gather the companies which uh, are acting in, in the right direction. And we see lots of them happening, uh, really blossoming today. And there must most of them are based out of France or out of Europe, and this is very promising. Very good. Thank, first of all, a big, on behalf of Blanca and the whole audience, thank you so much for finding time in your busy schedule to come and share with us. I think we hugely appreciate that. Um, and indeed, Fred will share with everyone the Tech for Value stuff and all those companies that are hiring. Um, indeed, it's going to be a very interesting time, not only for Blah Blah Car, but for the whole tech ecosystem here in Europe and beyond. Um, what's next for Tech Talks? Here you can see on the screen a whole set of talks that we have coming up. That'll be also detailed in a follow-up email. Thank you for everyone. Have a good rest of the week and um, take care out there. I've Thank got you my so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.